Gary Wittenbaugh comes to us from Olwine, Iowa. He is a longtime gardener and a lifetime master gardener. For years, he has specialized in dwarf, slow-growing, and unusual conifers and trough and rock gardening. He was president of the American Conifer Society Central Region from 2001 to 2005 and received the prestigious Marvin and Emily Snyder Merit Award for service from the American Conifer Society in 2005. Please welcome Gary Wittenbaugh. Thank you. First of all, does everybody have a folder? If you don't have a folder, we have some up front here, or Tom can bring you one. Everybody should have the folder, hand up folder. It has a list of slides, so you don't have to write the plant down. You can just put a check mark beside it if you like it <coughs> on that. Uh, the most important thing in that handout is the membership to the American Conifer Society. Uh, that's more important than anything in there. And the reason I say that, if you see these conifers up front here, uh, I'm going to give those away to anybody that joins today, but I, I hate to tell you this, M me being a longtime Hawkeye fan, uh, the home of the Hawkeyes, Iowa City, is a touchdown, an extra point, and a field goal behind the home of the Cyclones, Ames, Iowa. So you're, they're, <coughs> you're uh, uh, let's see, a touchdown, a uh, that, that sounds to me about 17 points, uh, but behind. <laughs> so... This is a good chance to start to catch up. The Conifer Society is having their regional meeting, and it's going to be in Ames this year. It would be nice if it was in Iowa City, but they have more members than you do, so it's going to be in Ames. And we'll have about 15 gardens, and even though you're not a member, you're welcome to come. You do have to be a member for one day, but you're welcome to come. Uh, and I think we should get started with the program now. Uh, we get the lights down a little bit here. <coughs> I'd like to, there, thank you. Uh, <coughs> The title of the program today is, is not conifers, but conifer companions. And the best companion for a conifer is another conifer. So you may see a few of those in here today. And, and this is a meeting that I was at at the Dawes Arboretum. Uh, and, and I get a very hard time when I go to conifer meetings because I usually show up with at least three gals, but more, more often than not, it'll be four or five. They're, they're known as my entourage. So these are some of my conifer companions. And... As I said, the best companion for a conifer is another conifer, and each time we change uh, types of plants, you'll see a conifer. Uh, this is one of the good companions for a conifer, Pinus contorta, Chief Joseph, which is lodgepole pine. Uh, it's green in the summer and turns brilliant gold in the winter. It really lights up your landscape. And I would judge this as a dwarf probably growing somewhere in the four to five inch uh, range uh, each, uh, each year. Now, <clears throat> what we're looking for in conifer companions is small plants, and we're going to go through a series of trees. Everybody likes the Japanese maple, Acer palmatum, and at least in my area, I'm from Owain, northeast Iowa, and it gets much colder up there than it does here. I call uh, Iowa City the banana pelt, belt of Iowa. <laughs> but most people even have trouble growing Acer palmatums in, in the Iowa City area. And it's so cold in, in my area that if I go in my front yard and look towards the North Pole, the only thing between me and the North Pole is a barbed wire fence and two strands of that are missing. So I don't have any chance with Acer palmatums, except I cheat. Uh, this one was taken, by the way, in Indiana. I cheat with my Acer palmatums and put them in a pot. Uh, I have four Japanese maples in pots, and, and I've had them about 20 years. They do very nicely. I move them in on my patio in the wintertime. It's not heated, but it's about 10 degrees warmer than it is outside, and it's not in the sun, and it's not in the wind, and they do very nicely. You want to water them good before you put them in there, and if you can, water them once during the winter. This year, I didn't get to water at all because it never warmed up. We didn't have January thaw, so they went through the whole winter without water at all. Uh, a, an unheated garage would work fine, attached or unattached. They don't need any light, and it, they, they work very well in pots, and you can use uh, uh, palmatums that way. Uh, if I were to try one in the ground, uh, it probably would be a blood good. Uh, <clears throat> I have tried some of those in the ground, and it takes about a minus 25 or so to give them really a lot of injury. Even a minus 20 will give them some injury. Now, the one on the left there, Shana, was a witch's broom from blood good, and it's not as hardy as blood good. I've got that in my yard, and it really suffers every year. Uh, it, it looks very nice in Oregon. That's where I took that picture. Uh, the, the blood good on the, on the right-hand side was taken in Independence, 
and it's still alive. It's probably been in that garden about eight years, but there's some winters where it really suffers. So uh, I think the, the route of in the pot is, is better, and don't get too many because they're not all that easy to handle in pots. I used to have them in, in, in uh, heavy pots. I've got them in fiberglass or fiber pots now, and they're not quite so heavy. Now, surprisingly, there are some Japanese maples that will grow in the ground. Acer shiwasawanum aureum, isn't that a great name? It used to be Acer japonica, but that's too easy to say, so the botanists <laughs> changed that. <laughs> and this is in my yard. Uh, it was, when I planted that, it was about the size of my fist. This was about six or seven years later, and let's see if it's still alive. That's what it looks like today. And I have that planted. If I had my druthers on a marginally hardy plant, the place I would like to plant it is on the east side of something. And this is on the east side of my house. If you have a marginally hardy plant, the best place, and Chubb Harper agreed with me, is on the east side of something. The next best place, believe it or not, is the north side of something if it's a marginally hardy plant. The next worst would be the south side and the worst probably the west side of it. But I've had this plant almost 20 years. And it's, it's a gorgeous plant. It's a Japanese maple, but not Acer palmatum. But these Acer, so this is known as the full moon maple, by the way. Now, <clears throat> now the, the ginkgo uh, uh, is unusual as a conifer companion because normally ginkgos are big, and, and uh, that's not what I would like as a conifer companion. But this one works because it's not going to shade much of anything. It's ginkgo by Lomo Elmwood, and Mr. Harper came to my garden one day. He said, I know you'd like a ginkgo, but your garden is too small for regular ginkgo. He said, plant this one. It will work. And that's how wide it gets. So it doesn't cast much shade. As you know, conifers like sun, so it's not going to cast any shade on my, my conifers. Uh, and ginkgos are, are a great tree. How many of you ha have a ginkgo in your yard? Yay! That, that, that's great. Uh, <coughs> uh, most people are bound to determine to plant maples yet, and I'm afraid we're going to end up the same way we did with ash, is there'll be a disease hit maples, and then everybody will be out. But be diversified, and ginkgo is a good tree as long as it's a male clone. And, and of course, in addition to the leaves in the summer that are very unusual, you have that beautiful gold color. Now, as you know, we've had quite a lot of cloudy days this year, and I really wanted to get this with a blue backdrop. And I was waiting till the leaves turned gold. It was pretty good. I thought, well, tomorrow it's, it's supposed to be colder tonight. Tomorrow will be a good, clear day. And I'll be able to get this picture with a blue sky as a backdrop. It got very cold that night, and I went out the next morning, and every leaf lay on the ground underneath it. That's <laughs> one of the features of a ginkgo. When they lose their leaves, they all come down, bang, right now. So you don't have a lot of raking to do. Uh, you rake once, and you've got it. But all my leaves lay on a pile right under the tree the next morning. <clears throat> and maybe even better choice as a conifer companion in a ginkgo is one of the, the uh, witch's brooms from ginkgos, and this is Jehoshaphat, uh, very cute little growing plant. This is one I've got in my yard, and it grows probably about three inches a year, so it's going to take it a long time to get very big and, and do any hurt to my conifers. <clears throat> the seven suns flower, Heptacodia myconoides, is another very good small tree. And the neat thing about it, as you see, that's the flowers. Now, that couldn't compete with a flowering crab as flowers, flowers, but it doesn't have to because it flowers in July or in August. Uh, it starts flowering about the end of August, and so it doesn't have to compete with the flowers. And it's nice to have something that flowers late. Butterflies just love it. It's great for the butterflies. And then the best part is, not the flowers, but after the flowers fall, the sepals uh, are this rosy pink, and that lasts almost a month, almost all through September, or as soon as the flowers are gone into October. Now, this can be grown, like mine, as a single-stem tree, or it can be grown as a multi-stem tree. I like the single stem because I like to get things up in the air and out of the way of my conifers. Uh, but I have seen them grown as like a three or a five stem tree, and they're very attractive also. It won't get quite as tall, but it's Heptacodium myconoides, seven suns flower, and if you like butterflies, you're going to, I, I've seen as many, I think, as 100 butterflies on that tree. So it's a great tree for butterflies. Now, you're all familiar with viburnums. Normally, that would be a shrub, 
But Viburnum sibboldii is a huge shrub, or it's better pruned as a small tree. And this cultivar is wave crest. Now, Vi Viburnum sibboldii does not color in the fall, but Viburnum sibboldii wave crest does. It has bright red leaves in the fall. This is flowers in the spring and bright red leaves in the fall. That's what the leaves look like in the fall. And if you want to have fun, pull a leaf off and tell somebody to crush it and smell it. It smells just like creosote to me. Uh, it doesn't have any fragrance at all unless you crush it. Then it smells like creosote to me or tar, somebody tarring the roof. So it's not a real pleasant smell, although some people think it's all right. I, I, I personally don't. But it does have great fall foliage color. And it will get to be, I would say, probably a 20-foot tree in time. Uh, so it's a nice small tree, and that's what we're looking for to be, as conifer companions are small plants. Now, maybe my favorite tree, and Dr. Isles from Iowa State University and I have had many discussions over this. He told me I couldn't grow this in Iowa, but it's doing very nicely. has survived minus 31. In fact, I gave Dr. Isles one to show him that they would grow in Iowa. Uh, and it flowers in my yard around the 4th of July, so it flowers at an unusual time. Uh, the, the stems or, or branches, small branches, are sort of red colored. The foliage is extremely tough. I've never seen any insect damage on it at all. Uh, and there's Stuartia coriana, and then there's Stuartia pseudocamellia, which is the one you'll find at most nurseries. I personally think coriana is slightly hardier. Uh, some botanists say there's no difference. It's just one grows in Japan and one grows in Korea. But I did have this experience. If you remember, about four or maybe five years ago, we had an extremely warm March. In March, it was 80 degrees the last week for almost a week. Then about mid-April, we got where it was 20 degrees and stayed 20 degrees all day long, never got above freezing. And, and our native trees had leafed out, and it knocked the foliage off of a lot of our native trees. And I have my friend Diane in Independence has, I've got Pseudocamellia down at her place, and I've got Coriana at my place. I like to try things out, see. And her Pseudocamellia lost every leaf. My Coriana never lost a leaf at all. Uh, so there, I think there is a difference between the two. Hers relieved out, as did our, all of our native trees. It relieved out, but it did lose the leaves. But maybe the best part of this tree is the fall color and the bark. It has exfoliating bark. Isn't that a great word, exfoliating? Why don't we just say peely bark? It's much easier to say. But it has great fall color. Uh, I've seen it almost all red. I've seen reds and yellows and reds and yellows and purple. So it's a four-season tree. Even in the wintertime with that type of trunk and bark on it, it's, it's really very nice. Xanthocerus sorbifolium, there's a great botanical name. It's a yellow horn. And where does it get the name yellow horn? Well, actually, when the flowers first come out, that throat is yellow, which I don't like yellow and white together in a flower, but I can put up with it because it only lasts three or four days, and then it turns this rose color. So it's, it's much nicer. And it's a very small tree, but it looks very old. Uh, at, at say 10 years. It looks like it's been around. In fact, it looks almost as old as I do in 10 years, uh, but it's really at a young tree. And, and I'm not as old as I look, it's just that I've been driven hard and put away muddy. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is a great little tree. It, I would guess this probably won't get much over 15 to 20 feet tall. And, and as I say, it, it, even at that size, it looks very, very old. The European beaches, Fagus sylvatica, and this is one of my favorites. Most European beaches are very large, but this one, Tortorsa purpurea, is, kind of goes up twisted. I've seen some even without a leader. Mine did form a leader, and I've had it a long time, and it's, oh, I would guess maybe about 12 feet tall now. But it, what a great contrast with the gold conifers in that deep purple leaf. And this is when the leaves emerge. The, the smallest leaves are quite red, and then they turn into the deep purple. And it's a good tree for small property and, and in conjunction with conifers because it's not going to get very large. But maybe even better is this European beech here, red obelisk. We have this at the hospice garden, which was a master gardener project. And as you see, it stays very narrow and tight. It's not going to throw much shade on the conifers in the garden either, and that may be a better choice. Grows a little faster than the other one, 
and doesn't have quite the winter interest, but it's, it's a great tree. This is one of the best ones of these I've ever seen. Uh, it, it's a, a great tree. There again, the dark purple foliage, so it's nice contrast. And I hope you're familiar with our, our native fringe tree. This is Cyanthus virginicus. There again, can be pruned as a small tree or a shrub, has great uh, foliage or fl flower, and in the fall, the foliage is a yellow, bright yellow foliage. And it's a really pretty tree. I have this one growing as a shrub, but I think I'm going to prune it up as a tree. I have both the, our native uh, tree, uh, fringe tree as well as the Chinese fringe tree. And Alamus parviflora frosty. <clears throat> this is a Japanese elm, uh, but it's the true Japanese elm, not the Siberian elm that everybody just hates because it throws branches and it's ugly. Uh, most of the, of the, the uh, uh, Elmus parvifloras are not hardy, but this one is, and this is the winter when we had frost. The branchlets on it are very small and it looks great, but that's not why they call it frosty. The reason they call it frosty is because when the leaves come out in the spring, they're edged in white, and it's very attractive, and the, e the leaves are about the size of my thumb. They're very small leaves. Everybody that comes and sees those leaves say, oh, that's a great tree. It wouldn't mess up. And it, in the lawn, it doesn't. You wouldn't need to rake. The only problem with the small leaves in my rock gardens, it's hard to clean them out, so I just leave them lay, and they, they will eventually go away, but they're, they're hard to clean out of a, a rock garden. But it's not the Siberian elm. It's, it's the, the, the true uh, chi uh, Chinese elm. And, and most people call the Chinese, or the the Siberian elm, Chinese elm. In Michael Durr's book, he said almost always he can find something nice to say about a plant, but that Siberian elm, it's really hard to find anything good to say about it. <clears throat> and you see them all over the place. <clears throat> now, this is the Aurelia elata variegata, uh, and if you've got a lot of money to throw away, this is the tree you want to buy. For some reason or other, these have gotten extremely expensive. I think the cheapest ones I've seen and a gallon size are about $100 now, and I didn't pay anywhere near that for mine. Uh, but if you want to have fun with people, ask them what tree that will grow in our climate has the largest leaf. The people in the know, like Cindy Haynes from Iowa State and most of my Iowa State friends, say Kentucky coffee tree, which is a real good answer because it's a bipinate compound leaf, so it's quite large. The people that aren't in the know usually say Catalpa, uh, but both of those answers are wrong. The right answer is this Aurelia elata variegata. And the reason I say that, this is the leaf starting here and going clear up here, that's one leaf. Uh, this is the leaf here from here, clear up to here. Uh, Michael Durr says one leaf will shade a whole garden party. Uh, and that's about right. They will get as big as five feet long by three feet wide. Uh, so, and it's a perfectly hardy tree. This is the variegated version. There's also a yellow variegated version uh, of this. It's not quite as robust as the white variegated, and there's one that isn't variegated that's much cheaper. And it does flower. There again, it flowers at an unusual time for trees. About mid-July, it flowers, and then the, there's little purple berries come on, and the birds just love them. They're gone in a flash. So it is very, very, very interesting tree, and that's quite a large flower head on that, on that plant. And we're going to change gears now and go to something else, so we get to see another conifer. Uh, this is a Canadian hemlock, Everett's Golden. Most hemlocks like quite a bit of shade. This one does better in just a little bit of sun to get the good gold color. It's gold most of the year, but in the spring it's very, very gold. And it's a slow grower, I would say, three to four inches a year. And this particular plant started life off in a, in a real, uh, very, very hard start to its life. I planted it one day. The next day, my neighbor came over and said, you know that conifer you planted yesterday? It's laying out in your path. So I raced out, and sure enough, there it laid, roots out. But luckily, it was raining. Uh, squirrel, in my yard, if I plant something, the squirrels are bound to determine to come and dig it out because I'm sure I put a nut in there or something. <laughs> the soft, so he, he dug it out. And I replanted it quick, and that's been about 15 years ago, and it's doing very nicely. But I, if the sun would have been shining, it probably would have been a goner, uh, shining on the roots. But by, this, by it raining, it was fine, and it's doing very nicely and growing slow like I like to see them grow. Now we're into shrubs, and this is Vaccinium microcarpa Hamilton. 
which is, I think they call it some kind of cranberry as the common name. And it's a very, very tiny shrub, gets little red berries, and the foliage turns red-purple in the wintertime. It's a sweet little plant, works real well with little conifers. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Daphne. Almost everybody grows Daphne Carol Mackey. It's what everybody grows. And it gets about this tall because I grew one. It got about this tall, and then it split open. And so I gave up on Daphne Carol Mackey because everybody told me the same thing. And this is much better. Daphne Neorma eczema grows about maybe eight inches tall. It would go very wide, and the fragrance on it is overpowering. I've had people... Uh, garden cr clubs come to visit the garden, and, and they'll get jammed in that arbor there trying to find out where that fragrance is coming from. But it's Daphne Neorum is, is really a good Daphne. Eczema probably is the best cultivar, and eczema is getting very difficult to find, and I'm not sure why. The nursery I used to get it from uh, was out east, and the people got cancer. The, the gentleman that ran the nursery got cancer and passed away, and boy, it's hard for me now to find eczema. It's out there but you have to, have to search for it. You said that pink one? Yes, this, this pink one right here. This big pink, and, and the fragrance, you can smell it 20 feet away. It, it has great fragrance, and, and it's perfectly hardy. It is an evergreen. It doesn't lose its leaves. It's an evergreen, it, and it stays without much winter damage at all. Now, it does get large. In fact, it got so big in that spot, it covered my path up, so I had to remove it. But there are some smaller ones. Daphne arbuscula doesn't have quite the fragrance because it doesn't have quite as many flowers, but it stays much, much smaller. I probably have 10 different Daphnes in my yard uh, in, in all this type. Uh, some a little bit different, but uh, they're, they're just great plants. I have a lot of fun growing Daphnes. Most people are afraid of them, but most Daphnes are very hardy. I have no problem. Most of them are evergreen. I have a couple that are not evergreen but I have a lot of them that are evergreen, and this one is evergreen, and I use it in several places in my rock garden because it stays quite small. <clears throat> now, rhododendrons make a really, really good conifer companion, at least most of them, but most of the rhododendrons that are sold are the, are the PGM type with that purple flower, you know, you buy one, the neighbor has one, the neighbor next door has one. So it's kind of nice to buy something a little bit different. This one's going to be a little hard for you to find in most nurseries around here, but it's rhododendron slippenbachia, which is known as the royal azalea. And it does very well in my yard. People told me that I couldn't grow it in Iowa, particularly in Owain, Iowa. It wasn't hardy enough. Well, I've had it for 12 years. And out of those 12 years, it's flowered 10 of the 12 years. Two years, it didn't flower. One year, it was minus 31. The other year, it was minus 30. Those two years, it didn't flower. But I've had it flower at minus 25. So somewhere between minus 25 and minus 31, it kills the flower buds. But if it will flower for me 10 out of 12 years, it's, it's worth the effort. Very nice white with a, a light blush pink to the flower. And it has very nice uh, yellow colored foliage in the fall. And if you notice, the leaves are very unusual for rhododendron. They almost look like a chestnut leaf. Very, very unusual. Now this is a PGAM type, but it's, beside, but it's not the purple PGAM. This is a glow, which is Olga spelled backwards. There's a rhododendron out there known as a glow, and that's what most people have, but, or Olga, and that's what most people or most nurseries carry. A glow is much better. It's the reverse cross from Olga. Uh, it looks like the flowers are almost double, and I've probably had this 15 years, and it's never failed to flower. Uh, and <clears throat> this one now is, I would say, almost four feet tall, and it's took it quite a while to get that tall, and it doesn't grow all that fast, but it's beautiful every spring. Uh, deep pink, almost looks double flowers. And this is Rhododendron viscosum lemon drop. And this flowers in late July. Somebody said, are rhododendron flowers in July? I said, yes, there's quite a few. I have another one, Parade Flowers, early July. But this one, I doubt if any nursery around here carries it. And the reason for that is very simple. 
Most of you people, when you go to the nursery, do your buying in either late April, May, or June. You're not there in July when this would be flowering. So if the nursery person had this setting there in all its naked entity this time of the year without a flower on it at all, and all these other rhododendrons were sitting there with flowers, you wouldn't buy it. And the nursery man's not going to spend time explaining to you why you should buy this because it flowers in late uh, July. He's not even going to stock it because he knows he's going to have to spend time selling it to you. So why not be very knowledgeable and come to programs like this, what you have done, so now you know that there are rhododendrons that flower in July, and the fragrance on this is great. Most rhododendrons that I've had in the spring of the year don't have much fragrance. This does. Uh, you can smell this one th probably 20 feet away. And it flowers, in my yard, it flowers late July. My parade flowers early July. And the foliage is red when the, it is deciduous. The foliage is red in the fall when it changes color. Now, this is a sweet fern, Comptonia peregrinia. This is the catkins that form in the early spring. It looks very oriental with the catkins on there. And then this is the plant. Uh, and you want to plant it near a path so you can brush your hand in it. It has very, very nice fragrance. That's why it's known as sweet fern. Uh, and you'll find this very seldom in a garden. I had a nursery person tour my uh, garden as well as several other ones. And he said he has never seen so many sweet ferns in gardens in his life. He says, great plant, but nobody uses it. And I said, well, that's because they don't know me. And I've, I've made the people that I know plant it. And it is a very nice plant. You want to be a little careful where you plant it because it does have a tendency to stool out a little bit or sucker a little bit, but not bad. Uh, I have got this on the corner of my pond uh, and it's never bothered me at all in, in most gardens where I have it, it's, it's never bothered. This is a native shrub in the east, uh, uh, but I think it, it gets as far west as Wisconsin. But it's a native uh, road ditch shrub actually in some of the eastern states. But it's a great garden plant. Now maybe for most gardeners, and I hope some of you have this plant, for most gardeners maybe the best shrub out there is Fothagilla. Fothagilla gardeniae, uh, for a long time they thought it was hardy only to zone 6, zone 5. It's gone through minus 31. Uh, I tried to buy it from a nursery in Waterloo, and when I called the nursery because I wanted to put one in the hospice garden, he said, oh, we don't carry them, they're not hardy. And I said, well, that's strange. I've had one for 15 years, and it's gone. I always say it's warmer in old wine than it is in Waterloo. Uh, <laughs> well, it's not warmer in old wine than it is in Waterloo. This has gone through minus 31 degrees. Always flowers, never fails to flower. This is in the spring of the year. The flowers look a little like a bottle brush. And the books tell you it smells like honey. Boy, I've tried to get a honey smell out of it. It's a very nice, sweet fragrance, but I don't smell honey. But maybe there's something wrong with my nose. Uh, but it flowers this way in the, in the spring. The leaves are not bothered by insects. The leaves stay on, look very, very good. But the fall foliage is the thing. Now, one year my plant was solid gold which was very unusual. Normally, the, the foliage color is this. Uh, this was last year. Uh, you have reds and golds and purples, and, and it's a, just a fantastic show, and it does this very late. Normally, everything else is done with their fall color when this starts in. So it's a good plant for, for late fall color. <clears throat> they also told me I couldn't grow heath in Iowa, and I didn't think I could either. I thought I could grow heathers, but I didn't think I could grow heaths. But I kept killing plants until I found some that I grow. I've killed more plants than you can ever think of. <laughs> but if you don't want to kill something, plant dandelions and creeping charlie and Canadian thistles, and those won't die. Uh, but it's much more fun. Somebody says, yeah, but I, gee, I hate to spend $30. What if it dies? Yeah, but what if it lives? And by gosh, this one lives. <laughs> And, and you know, this has been flowering in my yard for at least the last three weeks. Uh, it's flowered just fine. It's gone through 20 degree weather and it's done this last year, the year before that. 20, it's, it's so stupid, 20 degree, it doesn't even know it's cold out. And flowers just fine. The foliage is evergreen, stays evergreen all year. The cultivar on this one is dark pink. And this is the, now this one is a, uh, a heather. And, and heathers are much easier to grow than heaths. The secret with growing actually either one of these is winter sun, 
summer or winter, excuse me, summer sun, winter shade. Uh, it's, if you can plant it, and this is at Diane's, if you can plant it like on the north side of the house, so when the sun is high in the sky in the summertime, plant it far enough away so that it's in sun, and then in the wintertime as the sun sinks in the, 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 the horizon in, in the south, uh, the shade moves out and it's in, in uh, uh, winter shade, it will do very, very well. Now, if you can't do that, you can do something uh, that will still work, and I tried it this last couple of years that it does work, cover them with pine boughs. Straw or leaves doesn't work as well as pine boughs. It, it kind of smothers them. But pine boughs give them enough light and, and yet uh, gives them enough shade that they will survive the winter. Uh, the only downside on these is the rabbits do like the smaller ones. When they get this size, usually the rabbits don't bother them, but I've had rabbit trouble when I first buy small things. I don't have a lot of money, so I always buy stuff really small. People say, well, you're not going to live long enough to see it grow big. Uh, I planted a hickory tree with a nut, and it's uh, about 50 feet tall now, so I, I don't plan on dying until I'm 150. <laughs> and then maybe not then. <clears throat> now, clethra, I'm sure all of you have clethra. Uh, I, I love clethras because they uh, flower at an unusual time. Uh, in the spring of the year, everybody thinks they're dead because it takes them so long to leaf out in the, in the spring. So don't, if you're not familiar with clethras and, and your lilacs are coming and everything is leafing out and this isn't, don't give up on it. It's, it's going to be just fine. Uh, has great fragrance. Butterflies just love it. Uh, I, I like this pink spires. It doesn't get very large, so it, goes, it works well with uh, conifers. Uh, it does have one downside. Uh, it likes to sucker a little bit or stool out, but you can cut those off with your pruners, and so it's, it's not a real chore at all. Uh, not, not, a, not a problem. Uh, I'm not a real Cotoneaster fan, but I like this one because it works well with con conifers and it has nice uh, fall color. This is known as Tom Thumb. This is the fall color and it climbs over rocks very nicely. It grows flat on the ground and I keep it pruned down so it, it stays small. Um, but I think that's the only Cotoneaster I have in, in, in my yard. Uh, and, and it is a nice one, particularly with the, with the rock garden plants and the small conifers. Now this looks like another Daphne, but it isn't. It's Tylotrichum spinosium roseum. Uh, the common name is, is on your thing there. I think it's uh, lung ward or something like that. Uh, but that is a shrub. Uh, it grows native around the Mediterranean Sea, so you would not think it would be hardy in Iowa at all because where it grows native is around the Mediterranean Sea. But the secret to growing this one is hot and dry. Uh, if it gets much shade, it's not going to make it. I killed one as I let a conifer get too tall and shaded it too much, and it, it died. But when it's in flower, you can't see the foliage. When it's not in flower, it has kind of small silver leaves on it, and it does spin up. With the name Spinosium, you might think it has spines. It does have a few, but they're not vicious. You can work with it without being vicious. And, and uh, this plant here is, I would guess, about two feet by two feet, and it's not going to get too big. I have a couple of them at Diane's, and hers actually are bigger than that, and she has a real great place for it, really on the hot south side of her house. And it's, she's got two of them. If she likes something, she's bound to have, determined to have more than one, so she has two, and they're doing very nicely. And it's a great little plant, unusual plant. You're not going to find it in many, many gardens. Now, <clears throat> Are, are any of you familiar with this plant? This is really unusual. Most people told me there again, I couldn't grow this in Iowa. Uh, it has these pretty bell-like flowers on it, uh, great red fall colors uh, in, in the fall. And I just love this plant. It is deciduous. It's not an evergreen. It doesn't get too big. Uh, doesn't have any fragrance, but the, the flowers are so unique. And, and what this is, Encanthus campionilatus, Red Horizons, and the common name is Red Veined and Canthias. And I've got an, another couple new varieties that I'm going to try this year, but I think it's just a really a neat, neat shrub. You know, the problem with most shrubs is they get so darn big. The, the question I hear people calling in the garden shows is, my shrub got eight feet tall, how do I get, make it smaller? These will stay nice and small for you. I don't think I've pruned this at all yet, and I've had it at least 10 years. Now, when this is in flower, and there again, I, I have never seen this in anybody's yard but mine or somebody that I forced to buy it. Uh, 
<clears throat> this is, is mountain laurel. Now, they don't get as big in Iowa as they do on the East Coast. Uh, on the East Coast, they can get pretty good size. But I've had these for at least 15 years, and I have four or five different plants. Uh, this is Sarah. Uh, it's the mountain laurel, and, and it probably has the best flower of all the shrubs that I have in my yard. Uh, when I had the garden rendezvous last year, by the way, if you join the Conifer Society, you also get on my garden rendezvous list. And that doesn't cost you anything to come. It's just a trip to, to tour gardens, and we usually have a lunch that might cost something. If, if, depending on who's doing it, we usually $5 lunch. But when I had the garden rendezvous last year, it was the 10th anniversary, and we held it back in my yard again because I had held the first one. And these happened to be blooming. And Dennis Hermson from Farley, who was a big conifer person, I thought he was going to have a stroke when he saw these these calmias in bloom. He, I think he took up at least 100 pictures of these. And when they are in flower, uh, it, I almost have dug them out because nobody pays any attention to my conifers when they're there. They're busy looking at the calmias. And I have probably six or seven different calmias, and, and I like every one of them. And it also is white ones. There's, uh, there's ones with spots on. There's ones with bands on. They're, they're just all nice, and they have such, as you can see, the buds are kind of very unique, and then when the flower opens, it's, it's really great. Probably the best flowering shrub, if you read Michael Durr's book, he says one of the best flowering shrubs in, in North America. Now, <clears throat> this is sort of a ground cover. It's a little shrub or, or a ground cover plant. Sabuco, in his book, The Best of the Hardiest, says the landscapers have really missed the boat on this because everybody's looking for that ground cover that will grow in full sun. And then the other half of people are looking for that ground cover that will grow in full shade. So then you've got to have to, well, this one will do just as well in full sun as it does in full shade. I have two of these plants, and I try to keep them from becoming ground covers by not letting them stool down to the ground. But I have one planted in full sun, one planted in full shade, and I see absolutely no difference other than if I look real close, maybe the leaves are slightly smaller on the one in shade. But you have to look really close. And they are evergreen. They never lose the foliage. Always look like this. A great ground cover plant or, or small shrub. Uh, I would say probably one of the better ground cover plants because they will work in either full sun or full shade. Now the flower on them is not much. You're, you're growing it for the, the green foliage, but it does flower. There's the flower in, in early spring. It's a tiny little red flower. So it's, it's, it's not much as far as flowering. It's, it's sort of like a hosta flower, you know. The, you grow the hostas for the leaves. You don't grow them for the flowers. Now, I know there's a lot of hosta lovers that might throw sticks at me for saying that. But if you're growing hostas for the flower, I can tell you plants that grow much better to, for flowers. Oh, it's time for a conifer again. I was getting worried there. We wasn't going to have... <laughs> This is Picea bicolor, and that's a great name, bicolor. As you see, it has two different colors foliage. Some of it's blue and some of it's green. And this is Howell's dwarf, or you might find it as Howell's tiger, tiger tail dwarf, but you don't need the tiger tail part. And these little things out here, the flowers actually are, are inflorescence. Uh, they're the little cones uh, in the spring of the year. It, what a great color for, for, for flowers or cones. And then on top of that, you have the new growth coming on. So you have the new growth, the, the green growth, and, and the, the red cones. Great little plant, stays very low. It's not going, to get, not going to get too big. And I just get all excited this time of the year because I know this is going to all take place within the next couple months here now. And, of course, the hydrangea vine, which you plant, they say you plant this for your grandchildren. Well, it grows much faster than that. Uh, there are, are a few vines that I have, and, and they work fairly well with conifers because they go up instead of out, so they don't take a lot of room. Uh, this is uh, my hydrangea vine. Uh, I had it planted. They say they, to plant them in shade, they like shade. I had it planted on the north side of the house, and it wasn't doing anything. Uh, <clears throat> so I moved it to the north side of an arbor, and it took off, and it's doing very well. It flowers all the time, so it looks, looks very nice. A another vine that I have, and, and Michael Durr said he took a group to England, and this was their favorite plant is this uh, Actinida colchamida, or kiwi vine. And in the spring of the year, the green leaves come out, they start to turn white, and then they'll turn pink. Uh, the only thing I've discovered on this is if we have one of those cold winters where it knocks the leaf, or cold springs, where if after they've leafed out, it, it, it kills the leaves back and it has to leaf out again, second leaf out won't turn variegated. 
it's, it's just always green, uh, which very seldom happens, but it has happened. And I, I didn't get any white. <clears throat> now, wisterias, will they bloom in Iowa? They will if you get the right one. This is the blue moon wisteria. It's, the common name is Kentucky wisteria. This was uh, fr from Rice Creek Gardens in Minnesota. Betty Ann Addison uh, developed this according to the extension office up in Minnesota. And it always flowers. It never fails to flower. Uh, they're working on a couple different colors, but they don't flower quite as consistently. Uh, and it's a pretty fast grower. They say they won't flower for three or four years or five or six years, but this normally, this one here flowered in a couple years and another one I got flowered in a couple years. By the way, this is one of the gardens that you will be touring if you come to the Conifer Society meeting in Ames. This is down the road from Ames in Alamon, Iowa, and it's, it's a fantastic garden. Uh, didn't used to be there, but she made the mistake of getting next to me, and somehow she got a big conifer garden out of it. <laughs> and time to change gears again, enough on, enough on the vines. This is a Serbian spruce called White Tops. Uh, it gets so gold that the, the tips turn almost white. They're, again, great companion for the darker green conifers. And, of course, we have hardscape as conifer companions. And maybe the best hardscape you can put in a conifer garden is a gazebo. Uh, framed with a conifer, this is Larix decidua uh, diana, or Larix camphorae diana, excuse me, uh, framing the, the gazebo. Uh, <clears throat> we like to call this conifer Diane because that's what her name is, is Diane. But it's, it's a, a gazebo is a good companion for your conifers. And if you get dealt lemons, by make lemonade. Here's a tree that died, so let's, let's carve it into, for a conifer garden, this is in Paula's garden again, the garden that you saw the wisteria in. Uh, she had a, a, a fella came with a chainsaw and carved pine cones. Uh, and if you look real close, you can see a squirrel peeking its head around the corner there. He also carved a squirrel on it. So this, if, if you get dealt, if, if life deals you lemons, make lemonade out of it. And, of course, there's rock. They're great conifer companions and stone walls, but the, the rock are the, are the big feature here. And uh, the, <clears throat> the plants that are there uh, to the far left is, is Globosa vertus. I always call it the monster because it looks, if you're a Bugs Bunny fan, which I used to be, uh, they used to have this pink thing that ran around and all you could see was its eyes. This was what that looks like. And, and then you have Juniper procumbens nano over the wall here. Uh, you have Thuya corientis, Glauca uh, uh, strata here, where it has silver underside foliage and an oak leaf hydrangea, which if it was my garden, I wouldn't have an oak leaf hydrangea, but Diane wanted one, so I, I, I let the girls have their way once in a while. <laughs> and Diane wanted a fountain, but she didn't want one of those fountains with the big ducks on or the big uh, bears or whatever. She wanted a simple fountain. So I said, how about a millstone for a fountain? She said, oh, that'd be great. Where are we going to find a millstone? I said, well, we're going to go to uh, Stone City and have them make us one. So I, we went to Stone City with my van and measured how wide my van doors was. And my van door would put four foot through the door. So that's how big that stone, millstone is. It's four foot wide by about four inches thick. And it's heavy. Uh, they, they loaded it in my van with a forklift truck, and my van went like that. And we got it home, and we, Diane had somebody come and set that millstone way up here at the top, so there's a little incline. And she said, now, how are we going to get that down where I want it? And I said, don't worry about it. I'll do it. And she says, no, you're not going to do it unless I'm here. Well, I didn't really want her there because if something happened, I didn't want to have to worry about somebody else getting hurt. So she had to be gone one afternoon, so when she came back, I had moved this millstone into place. I won't get into how I did that. If you want to know, I, you can ask us later. Uh, but I put that on there myself. And when the first time I set it, it was too high. I didn't like it, so I had to lower it down. Uh, but she just loves it, and it does make a great uh, uh, fountain. And two of my other girls had to have, one of them has one, Paula has one similar to that. Pam has four stacked, four high. Make a nice fountain. And, of course, paths. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Jamie Byer, the water garden guy, but he's also the rock guy. And he, this is his favorite type of path. I did this at Diane's. I made just a little sample. I said, Diane, how do you like that? She says, I love it, but we can't make a path that long. It'll take you 50 years to get it done. I said, no, it won't. Uh, but this is all field stone. 
And I went out to a field stone pile and picked out everything I could that had one flat side. And they have to be deep. You have to dig down because otherwise they're wobbly. So they're probably most of those are at least seven or eight inches thick. And then I went to the pile and, and picked those out. It makes a beautiful path. It's one of the best paths I've ever made. Is, and of course, Paula, she saw it. She had to have one. Hers isn't that long. I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't do it. I didn't know there was so much competition, but, but you gals seem to have quite competitive nature in your gardening. And of course, trough gardens are great as conifer companions. Uh, not only can you put conifers in them, but they look great setting in amongst the conifers. You can move them around as conifers grow, and if the hole where you got them fills up, you can move them around. Works very well. Or if you don't want to make a trough, find yourself a rock that you, with a hole in it that you can plant conifers in and other rock garden plants. That's a great little rock there. Makes a beautiful little garden. And instead of just one conifer this time, you're going to get to see several conifers. This is what my backyard looked like last fall. And it's great to set out on my patio and, and look out the window. It's just terrible to have to look at such a thing. Uh, this is a false larch, Pseudolurex amabilis. Uh, this is a bristlecone pine, uh, Pinus aristata. This is a sembray pine, Pinus sembray nana. This is a, a Picea pungens, R.H. Montgomery, a Colorado spruce. Uh, this is Camisiferous ficifera boulevard. This is uh, a Abies uh, Coriana aurea, a gold or, uh, cor Corian spruce. A and this is a, a true cedar, uh, <coughs> Cedrus atlantica glauca pendula, that plant that you see growing in the road ditches in Iowa and all the farm fields that you call a cedar is not a cedar because cedars aren't hardy in Iowa. Can anybody tell me what it is? That's correct. It's a juniper, Juniperus virginiana. Everybody calls it an eastern red cedar, but it's actually a juniper. And on why it got called an eastern red cedar, I don't know, because all the other junipers, the Rocky Mountain juniper, the Utah juniper, are go by the common name juniper, but ours has to be go by, instead of uh, Virginia juniper, ours goes by eastern red cedar. The only thing I can figure out is people in the Midwest could not pronounce juniper, so they called it eastern red cedar. <laughs> and now we're going to get into... The, what, what Cindy would call perennials, I call them rock garden plants because I give her a bad time about perennials. But I have a rule of thumb that when I use uh, flowering plants or perennials, I don't want the foliage to be any taller than six inches. So that puts mostly my plants into rock garden type plants. And in Aquilegia, your columbines, you know that big tall thing that you have in your perennial garden, how about one that's only six inches tall? And that's a beautiful little rock garden. Uh, this grows in the Rocky Mountains, by the way, out west, this one. Saxon, Montana usually means of the mountains or of the rocks. And then, of course, there's tulips, the regular tulips, uh, the Darwin hybrids and all those get way too big, plus they're basically really only an annual. You want to go with the wild tulips or species tulips. This one is almost too big, but there's some that are only two or three inches tall. This is not bad. This is only about six inches tall. But there's many species or wild tulips that work really great, and they're going to stay there forever. They will increase a little, but not, not too bad. And how about some of our native plants? Uh, Sanguinaria canadensis bloodroot. This is in my garden. I just love bloodroot. Uh, it's already blooming in, in my yard. But maybe the better one is this. This is uh, a bloodroot also, but it's a double bloodroot. Sanguinaria canadensis multiplex. Uh, the only problem with it is if you look in the bulb catalogs at this plant, they get almost $20 for one little bulb of, of this plant. They're very, very expensive. Uh, uh, there's about $500 worth right there in, in this. This is my yard. I have given some to Diane and Paula because they say there is a chance that this will get a disease and you might lose it, so I want to have it in a couple of different places. Uh, my patch is getting very large now. I, I just love it. The foliage is much bigger than our native bloodroot, uh, and it lasts a little bit longer. It's, it's a great, great plant. And this is the plant close up. That's the flower. And how anything that white can come up through black dirt, I don't know. But it, it's, it's very, very white. Uh, they're just starting to come out right now. And this is an Ethionema, uh, one of the rock garden plants. Really, really nice little, little plant. And Dianthus, the, the garden pinks, uh, the, the tall ones, there's many, many rock garden plants, three to four, maybe five inches tall. 
uh, is all the bigger they are, work very well with conifers because they're not going to uh, shade the foliage. I have that six inch rule. I don't want my foliage to be any taller than six inches. Now, Saxifragia is a great plant, sort of looks a little like a Sempervivum. Um, most of them like shade. This one will tolerate full sun. Uh, the foliage definitely is, is not taller than six inches, but I will allow the flower to be taller. The only problem with the Saxifragias is once they flower, you hope they've set out little offsets because the plant that flowers dies. The plant that flowers dies. So once this is done flowering, and it takes about eight years before it flowers, I don't plant these for the flowers. The foliage is what I plant them for. The, the foliage will die, and you hopefully they will reset, and most of the time they have. But this is one of the saxifrages that will tolerate a lot of sun. This one will not. I have this planted in the shade, uh, and some of the saxifrages do not die when they flower. This is one that does not. Maybe my favorite rock garden plants or conifer companions in this type of plant is the Sempervivum, and this is a great one, Red Ace. Uh, Sempervivum, uh, common name would be house leek. I know you ladies like to call them hen and chicks, but that's not near as good a name as Sempervivum. I don't know if there's any marines here. If you're familiar with the term Semper Fidelis um, or Semper Fi, always faithful is what that means. Sempervivum means always alive. And that's true. They're 12 months of the year, they'll be doing something. Normally, this time of the year, they change color quite a bit. Uh, and it depends on what kind of soil they're growing in, how much water you've given them. This red ace, everybody that comes, can I have one of those? And so my, pile, my plant never gets very big because I'm always giving somebody one of those. And if, if you're a gardener, you also might have another hobby. And Paula has another hobby. She's a quilter. So I said, how would you like a quilt in your garden? She says, a quilt in my garden? How can we do that? So this is her garden quilt with Semper Vivums. Uh, made, uh, found little thin lime rocks, made the quilt squares, and these will fill in and cover most of those little squares. So that makes a nice little, you can do a lot of different things with, with Semper Vivums. Uh, the only problem with, with hen and chicks or sempervivums is that there again, the chick that flowers is going to die, and they have uglier flowers by far than the hosta does. Uh, they, not, not many flower, but they do. Uh, and there's one or two, just like hostas, there's a few that have fairly decent flowers. There's a few sempervivums that have fairly decent flowers, but mostly not. And there's almost as many cultivars, probably more, of, of sempervivums or hen and chicks than there are hostas. There's hundreds and hundreds of cultivars. Of, and, and there's an example, this is in one of my pots, of, of the different colors and cultivars of, of Semper Vivums, from big ones to small ones, from red ones to yellow ones to green ones. And they change color all year long. In the spring, they'll be one color. Summer, they'll be one color. Fall, they'll be another color. And this is a touchy-feely plant. Uh, everybody that comes wants to know if they can touch it. This is sandwort. Uh, and it's not grown for the flower. It has little white flowers on, but it's grown for the foliage effect. And it's only about an inch tall, but it spreads out. looks very similar to moss, but it's fun to touch it. And sedums, there are some sedums I, I really like. Uh, this is quite a bit different than Autumn Joy, much, much shorter. Uh, and the only problem with sedums, you have to be a little bit careful because some of them are very aggressive, very invasive. This one is not bad, and if you can keep it dry enough, it gives you that great red color. Really, really looks nice. Maybe my favorite rock garden type plants are the gentians. The spring gentian, gentian acolis. Acolis means no stem, and these do not look like they have any stem at all. But you haven't seen a blue flower until you've seen a gentian. I had a rock garden person come to my garden, and the first, time, first thing he said, this was in full bloom, very pretty good size plant. He says, you can't grow that in Iowa. It won't bloom in Iowa. How come here's this blooming? And I've never had any trouble with them blooming at all. I've got them at Diane's. I've got them at Paula's, two or three other places. They're a great plant. Uh, there again, the foliage probably is only two or three inches tall. When it flowers, the, the flower may be another three or four big blue. And I, I probably have 20 different Jensen cultivars in my yard. The spring Jensen's. I, I like the spring Jensen's. I do have a few fall ones, but they're not as much fun. Then there's companionaries or bellflowers, which are a common uh, uh, perennial gardener, but these are very short 
and rather than bells, they're more like stars. And, and this is a good cultivar, stays very, very small. And there's a lot of times that work very well as conifer companions. This is a gold thyme. The only thing with thymes, they can get a little bit big. They don't get tall, but they'll spread out. So you have to keep them sheared back. This is Evergold. There's a lot of different thymes that I really like. There's one called Elfin that gets almost coal black in the winter and then turns back to green in the, in the summertime again. It's just coming to life again now. <clears throat> And Candy Tough, Iberus Sempervirens, October Glory, and it's said in the, in the literature that it would bloom in the spring, in the fall, and it does bloom in the fall if you look quick, and in about one or two flowers is all, uh, but it blooms great in the, in the spring, so it, it's fine, but it doesn't bloom in the fall like they told me it was going to. And Pussy Toes, and you can see where it gets the name Pussy Toes. The flowers look very similar to little cat's paws. Uh, I, I don't think the flower is that attractive. It's not bad, uh, but I don't think it's that attractive. But the foliage, once the flower gone, is gone, is great. It's really a blue-gray foliage in the fall of the year particularly. Looks really outstanding. Uh, so they're a nice plant, and they, they can take a lot of dry. The reason rock garden plants and conifers work so well together is because neither one of them like a lot of moisture. Uh, so they work, and, and a lot of perennials do like a lot of moisture but rock garden plants do not. So they work very well together with, with conifers. And of course, veronicas, you know, your great big tall perennial veronicas, there, there are some that are very small. This one, there again, the foliage probably is only two or three inches tall. On this one, the flowers are not much taller than that. It's a, a really good companion for conifers because it doesn't get so tall. And believe it or not, cactus work out well. There again, they don't like it wet. Uh, and, and some places, like next to the foundation, under your eaves, nothing grows well, but cactus grow very well. Now, believe it or not, cactuses are hardy in Iowa, uh, particularly the opuntas or prickly pear, but they're very aggressive. You want to have a big area to grow prickly pear, so I cr try to grow the barrel cactus, which this is. Uh, there's quite a few hardy barrel cactuses, more of the ball cactus, which this is, uh, and they're not near as aggressive. They, they don't try to take over everything. But I, I, the, the last book I was reading on, on cactus, it said that there are native cactuses in every state except two, and they were out east, which I was surprised. Um, but there are native cactuses in Iowa, which they are puntas uh, type. I get most of my cactus from Intermountain Cactus, and I've got a new place that I get, get cactus. If you want to get into cactus gardening, I have a whole area I call Monument Valley that's in the, I'm in the cactus gardening. Uh, John Spain, Growing Winter Hardy Cactus is probably the best book out there. It's a small book, not very expensive. And he goes through and tells you what cactuses will always live, what sometimes live, and what's never live. Uh, so that's it's got kind, of a, kind of a neat book, but it, it's, it's uh, kind of a nice book to have if you're going to get into the cactus gardening. And, and to keep Cindy placated, I, I don't know if how many master gardeners are here, but Cindy Haynes is the perennial gal at Iowa State. And, and she, uh, of course, to keep her happy, I, I've got her into rock gardening and conifers now too. But to keep Cindy happy, I still do have a few perennials. I started with uh, annuals and then I got into perennials. And this is one of my favorites because it has blue flowers. My brother used to say when people would come and they wanted to know what color the flower was going to be, he said, probably blue. Uh, that's the only thing he plants is plants that have blue flowers. And this flowers late and has very nice red foliage. Uh, Cindy told me it was marginally hardy, but I've never had any problem with it. And, and I've got it in a couple other gardens and, and no problem with, with hardiness. Uh, this is one I almost had to get rid of because there again, when conifer people, even conifer people come to look at the garden and this happens to be blooming, everybody pays no attention to anything with this plant here. They have no idea what it is. It's Indian pink or Spagelia melandia. Uh, it's a, a woodland plant out east, and it's on the endangered species list, so don't get it from somebody that digs plants from the wild, buy it from a reputable nursery. And I have a couple uh, sources there on, on your handouts, but it's, it's really a neat plant. In fact, Cindy used uh, this picture in one of her uh, books she has down at, uh, at Iowa State, one of the pamphlets she has on perennials for shade, I believe. And there again, this is supposed to be marginally hardy. Uh, I used to be very careful and mulch it all the time. I did mulch it this year, but most of the years I never get around to mulching it, and it seems to be just fine. And I do use grasses as kind of for companions, but not the real tall ones. 
This maybe is my favorite grass for a conifer companion. It's prairie drop seed. It, it's not very large, and the, the flower seeds or heads on it are, are very open and airy, and I like it real well. I do have some other grasses, but I don't have them in amongst my conifers. I kind of have them separated. And I discovered again this spring that grasses are great, but they're a lot of work. Uh, unless you can burn them because you have to cut them down. And it took me one whole day to get my grasses cut down. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. I work very slow now. <laughs> and, and this is what it looks like when you put it all together. Uh, miniature conifers, rock garden plants, rocks. Uh, this is uh, on the north side of my house, which I never used to have much of anything. Hardly anybody went over there. Now everybody that comes to the garden goes over there. I have conifers out here. This gets much more sun than this does back here. So this is kind of what it looks like when you put it all together. And of course, the, maybe one of the best companions for conifers is snow. There's hardly any plant out there that works as well with snow as conifers does. This is my friend's Chubb Harper who passed away about a year and a half ago. His yard when he had a lot of snow and boy, the last few years we've had a lot of pictures like this with, with snow on the conifers. And as a closing, I will remind you that the ACS Central Region Meeting it's June 17th and 18th at Gateway Hotel and Conference Center in Ames, Iowa, and I would have liked to have had it in Iowa City, but they have 17 members and you have seven. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>